Hey everybody, it's Bob of Trade Genius. I got my good friend Phil here. As promised, we're going to talk Bitcoin today. You're not going to want to miss this. This, this is going to be a master's class on understanding where Bitcoin's going to head. Stay tuned. Trade Genius. Hey everybody, it's Bob with Trade Genius. Usually I do fun ads, I talk about our service, but I wanna be serious with you for a second. We've been helping a lot of people trading for a long time. As you can see here, I wanna let them do the talking for me for a change. But most importantly, we wanna help you too. If you've not joined our service yet, come check us out, tradelikeagenius.com. Full service, you know, we have chat room, we have the algorithms for you, we give trades out every day, we educate you. So go to tradelikeagenius.com, check us out. What you get out of our service, is much, much more than what you put into it. And we'd like to see you in the room. Thanks for listening. Okay, Phil, dazzle us with the Bitcoin story here. Are we collapsing? Are we ripping? Does having mean anything? How does this look compared to last having, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Brave new world or same old, same old? Yeah, I think, you know, this cycle is probably going to be different than the other ones. And I see a lot of analysis on Twitter and things like that comparing the previous two cycles and uh, or three cycles. And, you know, you have very clean peaks and valleys between those moves. And, you know, the timing of those moves uh, basically have been very uh, linear. You can take the same when, whenever you bought them before the halving, you can measure out that time and then you can take that amount of time, put it on the back half of the halving. And that's been a very good indicator of where these cycles have been tapering off. But I think we're going to go into a different cycle this time because I think the macro, whether people agree with this or not, I think the macro has a lot to say in, in the way that Bitcoin is going to move. And uh, as you guys know, and, and we've been talking about, Bob, the macro is looking to be a little challenging as we progress uh, through through the year and into 2025. But uh, let's just dive into the charts and I'll talk you guys through it. So here's kind of our current situation. This is kind of zoomed out on a daily chart. And you know, you, you've noticed we just we're kind of in this parabolic move, right? And that's pretty standard for Bitcoin cycles. I threw a couple of projections on here. One was uh, that we were following pretty closely was in blue. We recently just broke off from that though. And I think we may go into a longer consolidation, which would follow the purple path. And that would kind of coincide with that scenario we talked about where you have a fourth president year and you don't really get out of the funk until you start getting into May. Any other year you'd be looking at bolting out of the month of March uh, and then April starts to see us move up but we've been really chopping around here and so I think this purple scenario is probably taking over. So that's kind of the big picture as of the last couple of days in terms of how price has been reacting. We were kind of at a crossroads here but the purple scenario seems to be playing out. So that's one view. The other view we have here this is a, a lo logarithmic chart of the entire price history of Bitcoin. And as you guys can see, one thing I like to point out is that the when you go into your bearish cycles, right? So these are all of the having cycles, right? If you pull your range from the, the having high to the bear market low, you'll notice that it, you extend that out on a 1.618 fib. A lot of times that's where the cycle, the next cycle is headed. So you could see that with the first having event, right? We peaked out in 2011. And then later on, we had our bear market. And then we our next cycle peak into 2013, topped out right into that 618, wicked off of this is a weekly chart wicked off of it on that weekly bar. Uh, and then we had a pause in the action, then another secondary move up, which sometimes happens. And that created that longer bear market so we ended up getting uh, this range from this bull market peak to this bear market low. And that gave us a 618 up here at 4,000 and change. What was it? $4,373. We hit it. We, we bounced off of it. And then we pushed actually higher over it. And so that was a very overextended move. Very, But that's what happens in these parabolic moves, right? You get these impulse waves that can get past these levels. But still, that FIB level acted as a support. You can see price reacted off of it on the code. COVID uh, flash low there, right? And then uh, so these levels, even though they may get pushed past, they end up playing out later on. So if we look at the the next bear market, right, we go, we pull the FIB down. That one gave us an extension, a 618 extension of 61,289. I mean, look where the look where our, our market ended, right? Right into it. And so if we do the same thing again, and because I think every, so what that tells you is every cycle has hit the, the 618 extension of the bear market, right? So if you look at where that leaves us now, the 618 extension is up at 
173 and change, okay, way up here. So I think realistically, you have to keep in mind that we could potentially see that play out. If we flip over to the Coinbase chart, so that was just the, the, the full historical chart of Bitcoin. But if we look at the Coinbase chart, the one thing that kind of gives me pause on the higher target, and again, maybe it's like 2017 where we just kind of blow past these, these levels, but you're in a rising megaphone pattern, which actually isn't on the macro, isn't bullish long term. So short term, it is bullish because it's implying that we're going to get these, you know, this is very typical of a parabolic move. You have the different stages, right? You have your support or bases, I should say. You have your support base, one, two, three, and sometimes you get a fourth and a fifth. We'll see how that plays out. Again, it, here's another uh, bear market fib pool, and we had the different 618s I laid out here. This pool has been very reactive. Mar the prices have been very reactive at these levels, so that implies we should see a reaction, uh, you know, up at 79, and then uh, up at 95, almost 100, and then 112. So, you know, you could see this play out in this rising megaphone pattern. So this would be like the lower, in terms of these high numbers and potentially where this market may top out, you know, I, I'm leaning toward this is probably more realistic, but hey, look, if things go totally blown off here and, and you know, things are just going parabolic, then I would say, okay, if this starts to really push past this, like without really pausing at these levels, then I think you do have to go look at that 618 up there at, you know, 170,000. It's Bitcoin. It can move very quickly in the final stages of the impulse move. You know, you'll have weekly bars that are going 10, $15,000 at a clip. So in, in three to four weeks at the end of that move, you can move, you know, 50, 60, $70,000 in that situation, but it's not healthy. It's oftentimes going to be an Eiffel Tower type of effect on the way. And so if we do get this scenario, let's say we do get recession, the, the capital flows start to contract, you know, the ETF flows start going negative and reverse. And why would that be? Because they're probably be a large rotation into bonds, then you're probably coming back down to the bottom of this megaphone pattern. And on the upside, you know, that's over $25,000. <laughs> so uh, it would make a much higher floor than what we've seen, right? If you go back in time, you know, where's our floors been, right? The, you know, a few hundred dollars and then a thousand dollars and then $3,500. And, you know, so the, the floors on the cycles are getting exponentially higher, which is what you want to see. But it is Bitcoin. Uh, it is prone to collapse and it is very sensitive to monetary flows. So so we'll have to see. The, the one thing that would trump this, Bob, would be if we do go into a supply shock, right? If everybody just starts to go on the accumulation spree, they're fed up with the debt, they're fed up with fiat, they know the dollar is just eroding like crazy, and people are just like, I don't care, I'm just going to dollar cost average into it, and there's this big rotation into accumulating Bitcoin, then the supply shock could just trump the cycle and everything that I'm showing you here. So you do have to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, the best way to do that is just kind of look at what the uh, balance is on exchanges. <clears throat> so if that number starts to fall dramatically, then and, you know, that's something to keep an eye on. Till then, you kind of have to assume that we're still in regular um, cycles, regular business cycles, and Bitcoin is still a risk on asset. And as such, then it's going to be prone to uh, these pullbacks. Yeah, and Phil, you know, just to throw an advertisement for us out there, that's one of the things that you you speak to in the room every day. You help people understand the supply demand imbalances and the retracements and the extensions on the FIB side. Bitcoin's really fascinating because it's one of the more, most pure math kind of assets that I've ever seen. And it really does respect, you know, levels very well. And we do that at Trade Genius. So people that use our crypto room do very, very well. And look, and we're not dogmatic. If we think it's going to pull back, we'll tell you it's going to pull back. So we're not, you know, this isn't religious fervor on our part, even though Phil is a Bitcoin maximalist. He's, he, you know, he, he, he was very, very smart about, you know, where you should be extending your, your efforts going along and also where you should probably be taking chips off the table if you're trading it. And even you said, Phil, this time we get a, we get a push up to that high on the Bitcoin side. You may even take chips off the table for the first time. Is that not true? Yeah, if we're going to get a blow off scenario, I think so, because I just don't unless like I said, unless I see that the supply shock is happening, right? But if we don't see the supply shock happening, it's just really just a blow off move, uh, you know, wave five type of thing, which are impulse moves, you would see that across everything. If Bitcoin's going into a supply shock, it will basically depart from the other asset classes all by itself. But if it's a broad blow off where the S&P 500 is heading towards 6000, gold's blowing off, you know, all this other stuff, and we're seeing the recession. Uh, metrics grow and grow. Yeah, then I think you have to because I think we are going to see one final time a big pullback in the price of Bitcoin. Now, after that, after we get out of that cycle, out the other side of, say, 2025, my belief is that we're going to go into the ETF era where if you look at what gold did, the ETFs on 
gold started in 2003, 2004, you know, and then it went on like a 10, 11 year bull run and did very, very well. You didn't see the peaks and valleys. Um, even gold had a very similar chart in terms of peaks and valleys prior to the ETFs. But once the ETF flows came, now all of a sudden pension funds and all these other things can start allocating money to it. Uh, and that creates a very steady flow because now you're getting all of that, you know, payroll, you know, a cut of all, everybody's payroll essentially is going into these funds, right? And it creates a very consistent flow versus the retail ebb and flow, which is very boom and bust. But we're going to get one more, I think, because of the fact that we just have not been into a recession yet with this asset class, right? Crypto has never been through a recession. And anybody is telling you that they think it's going to do X, Y, or Z and not knowing how it's going to perform through a recession is just talking bubbles because, you know, until you see it, you just, you have to assume it's risk on asset and it's going to do what risk on assets do. And that is to decline. So uh, one thing, if I'll, you know, shifting gears to the uh, shorter term here, you know, Bitcoin's come down to 61,000 area and currently it's, you know, pulled back again. And we're going to talk about what's kind of going on in terms of the underlying data in term, you know, market data. We'll get into that. But briefly here, um, the CME gap got a half of a fill. So this was the gap from the other week. We had a big weekend gap up and that took us to our lower high that we've put in. And that's why that purple scenario I showed you guys is lending to the idea that we're gonna have a maybe just like another couple weeks in consolidation then, which is healthy really. And then we're gonna make that run, which I think ultimately is gonna resolve in us going north of 100K. But we still have this half gap to fill. So I think we could still see a potential move down. Typically when we get away from the 55 EMA on the four hour for this, the futures. I kind of look at that as like a mean reversion target. So if you get too far above it, pulls back to it. And then on the downside, if you get too far below it, it tends to snap back. So I think we have a date with it, which would bring us up to about oh, 68K or so on the spot charts. I think that's probably a bearish spot. And then I think it we run the risk of filling this gap back down here, which would also hit probably close to the 50 day moving average at that point, which historically for Bitcoin, when it's in its parabolic cycle, you usually get one tap of that 50 day moving average. So that would check that box off, I think would be a very healthy consolidation. And then I think, I, you know, for me, I would get very bullish at that point after that happens. In terms of like things that have been affecting price, this is the heat map of funding rates. You know, it, it, there's a lot of derivatives in crypto, right? You have perpetual futures, which is basically like peer to peer trading. So either the bulls are paying interest to the bears or the bears are paying interest to the bulls. It's weighted, you know, against each other. Um, that's how those work. So when funding rates get really, really high, that means there's a lot of bullish leverage in the system. And so whenever you get this situation where all of these pairs basically you have these vertical line of orange or, or getting hot, right? That means that the entire space is overheated. And that's where we've been seeing the big liquidations happen. So if you're wondering like, well, gee, you know, Bitcoin's been having these big pullbacks, right? The biggest one we had was from 69 to 59, which happened very quickly. But that was this area here. You see how it was very, very orange. That means there was a lot of high funding on the bullish side. And that's what fuels those liquidations. More recently, we had this dump. And you can see, again, we had this vertical situation of funding, right? Across all pairs. And now it's set. So that's why I think we have a little bit of a reprieve in the bearish price action because all this funding is reset and, and that typically allows for a mean reversion move back higher. So you have to keep an eye on funding, especially if you're an active trader or you're doing leverage, because if this gets hot like this again, you have to be very, very careful. You can't trade without stops because these liquidations will come and there's big bearish whales that are in the market and they wake up when Bitcoin gets to this point, when the volatility gets to this point, when we have these multi-thousand dollar moves during the day, these guys get active again and they prey upon the leverage, they prey upon the funding and they'll, they're will they tactical. They'll deploy funds to the exchanges and then they will come in, create large market sell orders to cascade price, to cascade leverage down, uh, get everybody stops. And that's why you'll see sometimes, some days you might have like a, a flash crash, it seems of like four or five thousand dollars. So that's what happens in that situation you have to be very careful of that hey phil what can you explain to people exactly what funding is for those that may not be listening but may not yeah, be that's what i was saying before it's a peer-to-peer -peer perpetual futures environment so if there's more bulls than bears then the bulls are paying the bears to hold those positions and vice versa. So if the funding is too high in terms of APR, because that's how it's based, then you know, it's it's basically telling you that everyone's on one side of the boat. So when that rates, when those rates get high and, and, it, and it starts turning the, the heat map orange like that, you know that historically we're really, really high. In fact, on this chart here, you can see our aggregated funding rate, right? So that when that thing gets, I have a danger level up you know, near uh, 0.10, you know, that's every few hours, 0.10%. Like the APR on that is really 
absolutely nuts. When you get to that level, that's where you start to see instability in the market and then you get these big dumps, right? So whenever we start approaching these levels, like you can see here, right? We got uh, near point 10 there and boom, big dump, right? Uh, here we print near point 10, dump, and then big dump, sustained dump down until funding resets across the board. We're not, in terms of funding, we're just not there yet. Recently, we got up to here about point, almost point seven, and we did, it did contribute to this pullback. But as it stands right now, funding is not at a critical mass. That's that's one thing to look at. The other thing to look at is long short accounts ratio. All that is is just, you know, in terms, and this is from Binance because, you know, they're the big dog. So how many accounts are long versus how many accounts are short? Okay, so you have that ratio. And when it starts to get to, you know, I have basically a, around 2.0, 2.1 as where it's like, okay, I think we're, you know, that there's enough rotation in the sentiment now that you can go long. You can see how that level does pretty well at the lows, right? So you get these, you get decent bounces off of that when these readings get to these level. And that's where we're at now. And that's why I think we're just kind of hammering out a low here. We'll come back up potentially to test up towards 68, which is basically the support that we lost. Come back, test that. And then I think we may rotate back down. At that point, we may see funding back up again, and we may see this reset back down to levels that uh, would lend to a, a situation like that. The other one is open interest, and it's a little squished here. But essentially, what they've been doing ever since we kind of broke out above 50K, you know, price action has been a little different. It's been much more volatile. As such, they've been rotating us between where open interest is. And this is simply just open interest on the spot BTC pair at Binance. When we get down to like a, you know, 72,000 a reading on open interest, that's been very bullish. That's been very supportive of price. And when we start getting up here uh, over 82,000, 83,000, that's where price has a hard time and they tend to rotate it. So the way these guys are operating in terms of the bear whales that I think are influencing price action is essentially in creating these cascades is they're looking at funding, they're looking at positioning, and they're also looking at open interest. And so I think, you know, if you have any of those things that are pushing it, then I think that's where you have to watch out for the downside. And, and that's where we we're talking about this in the room the other night before we had this drop, I said, you know, we're open interest is really high right now. Funding was high. And then the, and then as this move came down and kind of reset open interest, funding came down. So you had funding elevated and you had open interest elevated. And then look what happens. You know, we lost 70K from the weekend, right? And quickly, we we're trading down towards 60 or sub 65 into the 64s. So, you know, that question is, are we done to the downside? And if we can get, you know, one more push down, like I said, maybe to the 50 day moving average, the open interest resets one more time down to this level. Yeah. Then I think we have a really good case now of, of basing out of here and then making our next move up, which would target 80, 90 and 100. And, and then that's where it gets really interesting, Bob, because uh, I, I'd like to see at that point, what is the entire market doing? What's the stock market doing? You know, what's commodities doing? Um, and if everything seems like it's just going for the stars, then uh, I think you you could run the risk of taking profit too early. Definitely want to be trailing up your stops. Bitcoin, when it when it does top out, tends to give you a, a topping structure and it almost looks like a, a few Eiffel Towers at the top. That to me is like a big red flag. And if you lose that structure, then you're probably starting now on a pretty big rotation, a big cyclical rotation. So my view is this. We never saw all time high before the halving. We got that. We never took out the previous cycles high. You know, we've always stopped above it. We took out 20,000 on this cycle, so that's different. So I think this cycle could be one that continues to be different. I think the macro weighs on it, and I think you actually get into a bear market post having, which has never happened before, uh, and that can extend into 2025. Ultimately, it's probably the last call for alcohol. If you, if you haven't accumulated one BTC, between now and that scenario it plays out through 2025 would be your last chance. And then after that, it's just, you know, getting one BTC is going to be extremely expensive because that ultimately... Where this is headed is a supply shock game. And, you know, you can throw out big, you know, numbers, but I, I ultimately think Bitcoin probably plateaus in seven figure land, right? Because uh, once that supply shock takes place, no one's ever seen this in a commodity where you, you know, you only have so much of something and you know that the, it becomes kind of game theory, right? Who's going to get the most Bitcoin before it gets to the point where you're only going to have the miners, the Bitcoin miners are going to be the ones that are going to be in, char in charge. They're going to be the new diamond cartel of this commodity class. And that's something we're going to talk about tomorrow, Bob, because you can make a lot of money, I think, if you correctly pick the right Bitcoin miners. And but if you don't understand the 4D chest that goes into Bitcoin mining and the management for these companies isn't doing the right things, you know, you, it can blow up in your face. And I think there will be a, a consolidation in Bitcoin miners through this next halving event, because if it plays out to the bear side, a lot of these guys are not going to be, be able to make it. I think the debt load is going to just destroy them, I think. My prediction will be that we will see some bankruptcies in some of maybe some surprising names actually in that space.
And that's our teaser for tomorrow, guys. We're going to talk Bitcoin miners. It's not what you think. Trust us. I think you're going to, people are going to be a lot of laughter and a lot of tears in the Bitcoin mining space over the next 12 months. So stay tuned for that. And we have a lot of material for you guys this week. Man, things are happening in the market. Man, it's just going to be an awesome week for trading. So stay tuned. Trade Genius.